Hello, Latin 2 students. Happy Thursday to you all. Uh, today we are going to be talking through books 3 and 4 of the Aeneid. Um, I hope your test went super duper yesterday. I'm sure it did. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> books 3 and 4. Book 3, is, there's a lot going on here. Um, a lot of um, little side journeys and side stories um, that are happening, and uh, this in particular is very reminiscent of uh, Homer's Odyssey, um, where Odysseus has all sorts of um, little adventures here and there before he um, finally reaches his his, uh, his home. <clears throat> so, um, book three, <clears throat> one of the first things that happens is the, the Trojans um, <clears throat> that have escaped Troy's fall um, go to Thrace, which is, a uh, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit north of Troy, and, um, they find here, uh, Aeneas is, um, tries to make a, a sacrifice, but, um, he, the, the wood that he gathers from a tree starts, um, spurting out blood, which is, um, obviously not a good thing, <coughs> and, uh, what they find out is that a fellow named Polydorus, who um, who was a Trojan, had been murdered there, and the spears that had um, pierced him sprouted from the ground. Um, it's a rather odd, odd image, but you know, with mythology, lots of things can happen. Um, so they uh, they have a proper um, burial and funeral rites and everything for Polydorus. Um, and he had been murdered by, uh, by the local king because he had a lot of, um, Polydorus had a lot of gold that he had taken with him, um, to be kept safe there. <clears throat> and, um, the Thracian king turned on him. Um, and one, one theme kind of you can see throughout a lot of, um, epic literature is the, uh, the importance of hospitality. Um, and you can see, um, with this instance, how that was not, um, was not honored. So Polydorus went to this king, um, and he was, the, the rites of hospitality were, um, basically thrown in his face, and he was murdered. All right. Um, so the Trojans don't stay there too long, um, but they then go to the island of Delos, where, um, there is an oracle of Apollo. All right. Um, and they seek the uh, wisdom of this this oracle. Um, they basically says to go to their uh, their homeland, their ancestral homeland. And um, and Chises, who is uh, Aeneas's father, um, understands this oracle to be a reference to Crete, the island of Crete. Um, and you may remember that oracles are uh, notorious for being difficult to understand and read. So, um, usually the first thing that you think of is probably not going to be the right thing the Oracle's talking about. Um, so he goes, uh, the, they sail to Crete and, um, they start setting up, uh, their, their city there. Um, but before too long, um, a really bad plague, um, afflicts them and, um, they realize that they cannot stay in Crete. All right, and Aeneas has um, some of his household gods uh, kind of appear to him um, and tell him, "Hey, this is not where you belong. You need to go to uh, need to go to Italy." So, um, Anchises then uh, kind of realizes that uh, he um, had made a mistake in reading the oracle. So, and then he he realizes that Italy is actually where they um, belong. Okay. Now Crete is, um, a good ways from Italy. So, uh, they have quite a bit of sailing left to do. Um, and one of the next kind of notable places they land, um, they encounter a group of rather nasty creatures, uh, known as the harpies. Um, and these are like bird-like monsters that, um, take and defile food. Um, they were once, uh, had 
been a plague to a guy named Phineas, um, who um, was judged by by Zeus, um, and now they are plaguing the um, the Trojans who try to um, try to have a a meal, and um, they just come and wreak havoc on everything. Very nasty creatures as well, um, <clears throat> and the Harpies curse uh, Aeneas, and they have. Uh, basically say, um, you're not gonna, uh, this is line, was it 347, um, but you may never wall your destined city till deathly famine, for the bloodshed here, has made you grind your tables with your teeth. Alright, so basically you're gonna be so hungry that you're gonna start, like, gnawing on your tables. Um, so, the Trojans are really kind of freaked out by this curse, um, and they, they leave that, that land, all right, um, the next, uh, notable place they come to, uh, is kind of a, a really, um, there ends up being a very beautiful kind of reunion, um, between, um, Aeneas and his people, and some other Trojans, uh, who had been actually captured as slaves, so, uh, the two people that, are introduced next, Helenus and Andromache. Helenus um, was a son of Priam, uh, who had been taken as a slave, and he is a uh, he's a seer, um, sort of like a similar to a prophet. You know, is able to kind of foretell um, things and have a lot of wisdom. Um, and the other individual is Andromache, and Andromache uh, used to be the wife of Hector, um, and. She, she had been taken by uh, Pyrrhus. You may remember Pyrrhus from Book Two, who had murdered Priam. Um, Pyrrhus, though, has been uh, has been killed, and uh, Helenus and Andromache are both um, free now, uh, and they've kind of set up a, another settlement. Um, and this is, I believe, it's kind of on the more western coast of um, where it Greece. So basically, if you go to Greece and you go kind of northwest, um, the land is called Epirus. Um, you can probably find it on an ancient map if you're curious. Um, and, uh, Andromache is very, um, very moved, very emotional, um, because, you know, Aeneas and Hector would have been very close, um, and their families were close. Um, and they are just overjoyed to, uh, to see each other and reunite. Um, and Helenus, in particular, with his, um, abilities as a seer, uh, gives Aeneas some very valuable guidance about what to do next on his journey. Um, a couple things to uh, to do, like to sacrifice, make sure he sacrifices to the gods, especially Juno. Um, also tells him to avoid the east coast of Italy. Okay, so not just don't just get to Italy. Uh, make sure you avoid the east coast, and the reason being is there's a lot of Greek, there are a lot of Greek settlements there. So if Aeneas lands with his Trojans, um, he is not going to receive a very warm welcome. All right. Um, he also warns him about uh, Scylla and Charybdis and to avoid them. Um, and Scylla and Charybdis are um, mythologically located uh, in that kind of strait or that channel separating Italy and Sicily. Okay, so that's kind of the traditional location for Scylla and Charybdis. So, um, Helenus says, hey, <laughs> make sure you avoid them. Um, and Scylla, you may remember, is that kind of uh, monster that reaches out from the cliff and, like, takes ships and sailors and smashes them on the rocks and, I don't know, eats them maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, and then Charybdis is the whirlpool um, that will gulp entire ships down. Okay. Um, so, uh, he says, hey, make sure you, <laughs> make sure you avoid them, all right? Um, and it's better to take the long way, you gotta take the, all the way around, um, all the way around Sicily before you come up to, uh, to Italy, okay? Um, so that's kind of his advice. Also talks about, um, he needs to, uh, reach the town of Kumai, um, and this is gonna be important, book six, um, where he, um, talks with the Sibyl of Kumai, who is a, um, a prophetess of great wisdom and power. All right. Um, and then they, they say their farewells, um, and there's this kind of a, 
beautiful kind of parting um they say we shall make a single troy in spirit um a line 669 670 may this task await our heirs all right so even though we can't be together right now um you know our our two cities are going to be unified um, as we all come from troy all right um so they uh continue on their uh sailing all right um they see italy there's a lot of joy there um and then they encounter kind of they sail by skill and charybdis but not uh not close to them so they're not in danger um but then the next um rather notable uh part is they encounter the trojans encounter um a fellow named uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful I Icomenides. um and he is a uh, former shipmate of Ulysses, or Odysseus, excuse me, and um, he has been trapped on the uh, land of the Cyclops. Um, so you get to kind of see a little bit of the Cyclops land as well. Um, and the Trojans have pity on him. They pick him up, um, and <laughs> um, Polyphemus, the most famous of the Cyclops, comes out, and uh, they see him with his gouged-out eye, um, and he's trying to like wash it in the water. Um, and then the, uh, the other Cyclops come along too. And thankfully the Trojans are able to, uh, get away, you know, just, just barely, but they, they're able to escape, um, from the land of the Cyclops with this, um, this kind of refugee on board. Uh, and then book three ends, uh, it's very sad, uh, ending, especially for, um, Aeneas. Uh, they... Um, they lose Aeneas's father. He um, he passes away um, at the end of end of book three. All right. So that is kind of um, that's how book three goes. Kind of some of the major points and events that are going on. Um, book four is a very very famous book, um, and this is the love story of Dido and Aeneas and how it ends tragically. Um, and this one you're not going to really find much of a um, correspondence, I guess you could say, um, in Homer. Um, however, there is a lot of, uh, Virgil uses a lot of the, um, from the poet Apollonius of Rhodes, which is a fantastic name, also a good goldfish name, Apollonius. Um, and he is the one, one, one of the authors that writes about Jason and the Argonauts. So, um, this kind of episode with Aeneas and Dido, uh, has a lot of similarity um, with the Jason story, um, particularly with his love uh, interest with Medea. Um, so there's a there's a lot that Virgil is kind of playing off there. All right. So um, book four, uh, you have um, kind of opens with uh, book four, and sorry, book four is also kind of back in real time. Um, so books two and three were all like Aeneas telling the story, um, the past story, and then book four kind of takes you back up to the, the present time, all right? Um, and book four opens uh, with Dido kind of just being um, just madly in love with Aeneas, um, and she confides in her sister Anna. Um, it's kind of weird to have a, someone with a very, very normal name right in the midst of all these, but, um, talks, talks to Anna about what she should do. Um, and she is, you know, Dido is pledged to, um, be true to her dead husband. Um, but she, she recognizes now that her heart has been kind of awoken. Um, she has a famous line. I recognize the signs of an old flame of old desire. Um, so, uh, Aeneas has kindled something in her that she thought was long gone. Um, and then her sister, Anna, gives her some advice and, um, she says, you know, you've, you've not been a fan of any of these, uh, suitors that have come calling for you, um, local suitors, uh, from these African tribes and all that. Um, but then why are you, uh, against, um, it, she says, will you contend even against a welcome love? Uh, so Anna encourages to, um, 
to go after Aeneas, but with the kind of caveat, make sure that you seek the will of the gods first. Uh, make sure that the gods are um, approving of your um, union with Aeneas. All right. Uh, so she uh, she does that. Uh, Dido seeks the um, what the gods say, um, and she goes through all sorts of sacrifices and you know looking through all manner of things. Um, and you get uh, there's some some really powerful lines in here. Uh, line ninety two. Um, so Dido kind of goes through all these rituals and says, but. Or, or excuse me, Virgil says, what good are shrines and vows to maddened lovers? The inward fire eats the soft mirror away, and the internal wound bleeds on in silence. Um, so you can kind of see this idea of uh, love um, not necessarily being a good thing, but it's actually something that kind of drives the person mad. Um, and it's a, kind of a, kind of an almost a negative view of, um, of love, but it's a fairly common in a lot of um, ancient literature. So love is something that's very destabilizing. All right. Um, and then later on, you can see, um, and, uh, like line 121 to 126, um, you can see that Dido, um, gets so infatuated with Aeneas and Aeneas with her as well, um, that they kind of lose sight of their duties to their own people. Um, it says towers half built rose no farther, men no longer trained in arms or toiled to make harbors and battlements impregnable. Projects were broken off, laid over in the menacing huge walls with cranes and moving stood against the sky. Um, so they both kind of start neglecting their responsibilities, which is a, um, it's a big, big problem because, um, you may remember that, um, as I said earlier, Aeneas is consistently marked by being duty-bound Aeneas, that, that pietas, uh, that term for duty to uh, your country, your family, and to the gods, um, and they're both neglecting that, okay? Um, the next kind of uh, thing, you, you have this um, interesting little uh, alliance, you could say, between Juno and Venus, and they kind of contrive a, um, a marriage between the two of them. Um, and Venus, um, for her part, you know, she, she likes love. That's kind of like her thing. Um, I think she also is probably trying to get back a little bit at Juno, um, trying to bring Dido down a little bit. But Juno, um, she really is into taking Aeneas down and distracting him from where he needs to be. All right. But anyway, the two of them, each with their own agenda, kind of come to the table to contrive this, um, this marriage and events that will lead to, um, their union, uh, between Dido and Aeneas. So, um, what happens is the, uh, the Trojans and Carthaginians go on this nice little hunting ex, uh, exhibition, exhibition, um, uh, yeah, trip. They go on a hunting trip. We'll go there. Um, and uh, they, a great storm comes. Um, Juno sends a, sends a great storm. And everybody scatters to uh, take shelter in the storm. And it just so happens that Aeneas and Dido um, came come to the same cave in the middle of this great big storm. And um, let's just say things happen uh, in the cave that we're not going to really discuss in detail here. Um, but a uh, couple uh, important lines here, line 233, um, after this kind of supposed uh, wedding of sorts, uh, that day was the first cause of death and the first of sorrow. Dido had no further qualms as to the impression given and set abroad. She thought no longer of a secret love, but called it marriage. Thus, under that name, she hid her fault. So, um, her relationship with Aeneas, she just kind of cloaked it in a in the name marriage and said basically it was all okay, and she didn't care what people thought anymore. All right. Then there's this really famous um, kind of personification of rumor, um, and it talks about rumor uh, flying through the earth and having 
eyes, um, an eye on every feather, and uh, as many tongues and mouths as eyes, and uh, as many ears, and um, it's just a really this hideous kind of monster of rumor that, that grows from this affair of Dido and Aeneas. Um, and there's some, some powerful lines here, 261, gossip of what was done and never done. Okay, so this kind of characteristic of rumor, it will say things that may have happened, partial truths, um, and then things that aren't true, you know, so. Um, and then 265, um, the two of them, Dido and Aeneas, unmindful of the realm, prisoners of lust. So they have kind of given themselves over to their desires, which is, um, especially from a Roman standpoint, is never a good thing. Okay, you need to control your desires and um, that sort of thing. All right. Um, and then uh, Rumor takes this uh, message of the affair to King Yarbus, who is a local kind of chieftain. Um, and he is, uh, he had sought Dido's hand in marriage. Um, and he is uh, quite furious that he's been supplanted by Aeneas. Um, and he prays to Jupiter. Um, and Jupiter. Uh, sends Mercury, you know, the messenger god, um, to kind of renew Aeneas's uh, spirits to remind him of what his duty is. Um, and uh, Mercury um, is to tell him that, hey, he's losing sight of future towns, the fates. Or so Mercury comes down to Aeneas and kind of um, just really lays it on him um, and tells him, hey, are, have you forgotten what your duty and your, your destiny is? Um, and if you don't think of, think of it for yourself, uh, at least think of it for your son. Um, what is this doing to your son's uh, future prospects? All right. Um, and Aeneas kind of has this, uh, this wake-up call. And um, there's this line on 384, 85, um, he's going to leave the sweet, the land of the sweet life behind, all right? So he's, he's realized that he's kind of lived in um, pleasure for too long, and he needs to get going. Um, and then he calls his men, uh, some of his trusted guys, together to get the fleet ready for sea. Um, but, unfortunately, Dido kind of catches, uh, catches wind um, of this uh, 404. It says, who can deceive a woman in love? Um, so she is a uh, suspect of him. And then she kind of has this talk with him about, um, you know, are you trying to, you know, are you trying to just leave without even saying goodbye? Like what kind of a, you know, what kind of relationship do we have here? Um, and there's an interesting, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, simile. Um, where she is compared to, this is an early part of 400s, she's compared to a, a follower of Bacchus that is kind of driven wild and driven mad in um, religious rites. So um, she's been compared uh, earlier in the book to Diana, uh, book one. You may remember that simile where she's compared to Diana. Here she's compared to a mad uh, follower of, of Bacchus. So it's very um, stark contrast. All right. Um, and then, uh, so she kind of gives this plead to Aeneas, plea to Aeneas to, to stay. Um, and then Aeneas has um, a very kind of emotional but kind of contained at the same time uh, response. Um, and he basically tells her that I don't want to go, but I have to. Um, and uh, he also tells her, 465, do not think I meant to be deceitful and slip away. Um, I never held the torches of a bridegroom, never entered upon the pact of marriage. So um, this marriage that Dido uh, is talking about, Aeneas, it basically says, I didn't sign on the dotted line, as it were. Um, and then he tells her uh, later on, um, 476, but now it is the rich Italian land Apollo tells me I must make for Italy named by his oracles. There is my love. There is my country. All right. So, um, he tells her that, Hey, I have to go. Um, and he, uh, 
he basically begs her to stop giving these um, pleas that kind of just tear them tear them apart. Um, he's like, let me let me go. All right. Um, she of course uh, is um, driven mad with uh, mad with sorrow, um, and. Aeneas, um, come, who's all broken up, um, but he knows he has to follow the destiny that the gods have laid in front of him. Uh, so you see 545 says, duty bound Aeneas, though he struggled with desire to calm and comfort her in all her pain, to speak to her and turn her mind from grief. And though he sighed his heart out, shaken still with love of her, yet took the course heaven gave him and went back to the fleet. All right. Um, so he is, um, he is unmoved in his resolve, even though his heart is, you know, kind of wrenched out of him, um, by having to leave Dido. Uh, it's very, um, very emotional, emotional scene. Uh, and then, um, Dido, um, you know, tries to, uh, tries to send Anna to, um, you know, tell them to delay, at least wait. Um, she just asks for time for the Trojans to not sail just yet. Um, and then Dido just kind of continues to spiral downward in her, um, in her grief, um, and her, her anger. Um, and she, puts on kind of a, tries to put on a, um, uh, a sh not a show, a, um, she deceives her sister, um, and she tries to make it look to her sister like she's, um, basically let Aeneas go, and she's, she's done with him, she's gonna move on, um, and she tells, um, tells her sister to get a, uh, get all of Aeneas's belongings together, make a, make a pyre, and she's gonna, basically burn them all. All right. Um, and she makes this story about all these different, um, kind of religious rites and everything that she's going to, she's, she's, uh, divined from a, from magic and everything. Um, and then, uh, she, she has this, um, kind of dialogue or, um, uh, monologue, I should say with herself um, and she gives kind of a line 740 to, um, I guess seven, uh, in the 750s, she kind of gives a rationale for why she is going to do what she's going to do next, which is, as you know, um, kill herself. So she is, um, she's too proud to go back to all those former suitors. Um, she can't just follow after Aeneas, um, in his, uh, in his wake, um, and there's, she's disgraced herself, uh, among her people, so, um, she resolves to, um, to end up killing herself, all right, um, Aeneas, uh, meanwhile, is, um, warned again by, by Mercury to say, hey, get a move on, um, and otherwise Dido's gonna may come after you. So Aeneas finally breaks, um, breaks anchor and he, uh, sails away. All right. Um, and then we have, um, kind of the end of Dido's, uh, earthly, earthly story here. Um, and she, um, she has this, again, another big long monologue. Um, and she ends it with uh, cursing um, Aeneas and the uh, the Trojans. And there's this um, line of foreboding on eight seven four eight seven five, um, talking about the two peoples, the Trojans and the Carthaginians. May they contend in war themselves and all the children of their children. All right. Um, and for your Roman history, um, this is a great uh, foreshadowing of the. Punic Wars, which will um, follow, um, take take place in uh, the third and second centuries BC. All right, um, so you can see a little bit of um, little foreshadowing there. 
All right. Uh, and then Dido um, falls on her on the on the sword that Aeneas um, left and and kills herself. Um, her sister Anna tries to rush to uh, to be with her, um, but you know it's she can't do anything. Um, and it's a very uh, very moving kind of death scene. Um, and uh, Juno has pity on Dido um, because she is trying to die. She's dying before her time because you know suicide is not natural. Um, and she sends Iris to um, kind of trim a lock of Dido's hair and to release her spirit from her body um, so that she can um, die. And uh, it's a very, uh, very sad, a very, a very sad scene um, to end book four. Um, but that is, uh, that is book four, the story of, of Dido and Aeneas. Um, let me know if you have any questions. There's a lot of um, kind of weird things, um, lots of people that are talked about. I don't know the answers to all of them, but if you have some questions or whatever, you're always welcome to, um, you know, shoot me a chat or, or whatever. Um, we'll read books five and six for next Friday. Okay. Um, and I hope you guys have a, uh, a fabulous weekend. Um, please make sure to do the discussion posts for book three and four and the reading checks for three and four. Um, if you knew them today, that'd be great. So you can have Friday off. Um, but I gave you Friday in case you need it. Um, hope you guys have a fabulous weekend and, um, just remember to, uh, let's praise the Lord for his, um, his mercy and sending Christ to die for us and then, um, to be, uh, be raised again. So, um, I, I hope you guys have a great weekend, um, celebrating that. So I love you all and talk to you later.